Hello, can you hear me? Hello, can anyone hear me? Hello, can anyone hear me? Um, I'm not sure whether you can see me or hear me. Uh, if I don't hear from you, then I will. Uh... I think if I don't, um, excuse me. Oh, I'm here seeing two. Oh, God help. Okay, so you can hear me. Yeah, I'm also not very, I'm not very sure. So good morning, everyone. Sorry for the slight uh, delay and uh, thought I was not visible nor audible. So if you can hear me, praise God for that. Yeah? So we begin with prayer. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Almighty God, we come before you this morning as we continue another day recognizing your glory and, your, and the wonderful deeds that you continue to to do for us as you bless us daily with your peace, joy, and love. Help us to enter another new day, wanting to experience your wonder, experience your glory amidst the crisis that we're all going through universally. Lord, bless us this morning. Bless all of us gathered here. Help us to appreciate all that we have and help us to Continue to wonder in your glory and um, to be a sign of hope for one another in these days. We make this our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. So I'll take the gospel of today as, as, as always and um, the fifth week of Lent Monday. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At daybreak, he appeared in the temple again, and as all the people came to him, he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and Pharisees brought a woman along who had been caught committing adultery. And making her stand there in full view of everybody, they said to Jesus, Master, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. And Moses has ordered us in the law to condemn women like this to death by stoning. What have you to say? They asked him this as a test, looking for something to use against him. But Jesus bent down and started writing on the ground with his finger. As they persisted with their question, he looked up and said, If there is one of you who has not sinned, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Then he bent down and wrote on the ground again. When they heard this, they went away one by one, beginning with the eldest, until Jesus was left alone with the woman who remained standing there. He looked up and said, Woman, where are they? Has no one 
condemned you? No one, sir, she replied. Neither do I condemn you, said Jesus. Go away and don't sin anymore. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. This is an interesting gospel passage that we call to reflect on in this season of Lent. And as we are mindful of what Lent is all about, a time of purification, really the gospel challenges each one of us. We know that this woman was condemned by the crowd. She was caught committing adultery. But here they were not Here they were not interested in, uh, in the law per se, because if it was, they would have also caught, uh, taken that man together with her and stoned, her, stoned them. But what's here? Trap Jesus. They wanted to trap Jesus with his answer. Now, the question they posed to Jesus was, Master, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery and they justified with the law of Moses and it ordered, you know, according to law, to condemn women like this to death. So they, were, they, were, they wanted to trap Jesus. So what was Jesus' response to this? It was very beautiful. Huh? They never expected or imagined that he was going to challenge them with, uh, with, with a question. Now, for Jesus was, he asked, um, is there any one of you who has not sinned? Let him be the first to throw a stone at her. So all went, all went away. Because he wanted to trap him in, in two sins, you know. If he had uh, freed her, if Jesus had freed her, what would have they done? They said, you have gone against the law of Moses. Then they can take action against Jesus. But if Jesus had condemned her, then they would all say, you're a hypocrite. You're talking about mercy and compassion. And yet at the same time, if I'm not mistaken, during that time, uh, the Jews were not allowed to persecute anyone uh, without the Roman authoriz authorization. So they would have taken uh, Jesus uh, to task. But Jesus just had one question. Is anyone, is there any one of you who has not sinned, let him be the first to cast, to throw a stone at her. So they went away. Yeah? They went away. And it's amazing. It's amazing how they all went away one by one. Um, they said Jesus, he just bent down to write, yeah? uh, to write, uh, what is he writing about? Sometimes I wonder that, you know, uh, my, own, my own reflection is that perhaps he was, as they came forward, he was writing their sins, you know, and they, and they saw their own sins before them. I'm not saying this is what the church is teaching, uh, but some of us tend to think that perhaps, you know, and they walked away one by one. Um, but uh, St. Augustine says, something of this uh, um just give me a moment uh. saint augustine says that jesus is portrayed as the divine legislator what does it mean in fact he says god wrote the law with his finger on tablets of stone that means you know go back to the ten commandments so thus Jesus is the legislator, he is justice in person. How profound eh, this expression that, uh, that they went away one by one. Eh? And, uh, and then when Jesus looked at this woman, he says, neither do I condemn you, sin no more. So what happens here, for me, my point of reflection would be, firstly, they were there not just to condemn the woman, but to trap Jesus. So it was sense of 
hypocrisy of self-righteousness, you know. They wanted, the scribes and the Pharisees looked at themselves as above everyone else. And they wanted to use this situation to trap Jesus. But Jesus, Jesus um, of himself, we can talk about his righteousness. His righteousness uh, set the woman free and he did not condemn her. It is like, you know, Sunday's gospel, I put a new spirit in you. This was a new spirit given to this woman, uh, the adulterous woman, so to speak. The new spirit is sin no more. Not to go back to the old ways. For ourselves today, are we guilty of adultery in our lives? we will be saying, wow. But I would challenge all of us, huh? all of us are guilty of adultery today. You know? I use it in the widest context of what adultery means today. Huh? Uh, we say God is our everything. God is all. You know, we have all kinds of hymns that speaks about how great our God is. He is our everything. He is our all, you know. If He is our all, then God deserves our exclusive loyalty, isn't it? He deserves everything. That means completely we must give ourselves to Him. But you and I know we fail, isn't it? That sense I'm talking about, we commit adultery. Um, by not being faithful to God in various ways. Sometimes we find other forms of love to entertain us, whether in animate or inanimate things. We find other objects of love and that can take us away from our Lord, from Jesus. Eh? So, if we truly love Jesus, we truly love our Lord, we will actually want to worship Him every day of our lives. But you and I know that this is not so with all of us daily. We tend to turn away from God from time to time. We'll say, you know, sometimes we can't help it because of our situation at our workplace or the circumstances that surround us. We, we perhaps out of fear, we do what we do, perhaps of not wanting to get into trouble, then we do what we have to do. So we avoid doing the right thing. In that sense, we, uh, we sin, we turn away from God, we're not faithful to Him. So we found other forms of um, love. Huh? And we need to come back from time to time to recognize that, uh, yes, we are all sinners. But the beautiful part of we uh, as sinners is in today's gospel, Jesus does not condemn that woman, the adulterous woman, in inverted commas, eh? in brackets rather. And he gives her new life. He gives her the freedom now to be living a life that must be pleasing unto the Lord. He puts in a kind of way a condition or to say sin no more. And that's important. In fact, at the end of the day, it's not a condition. That's our way of life, to live a life of righteousness before God. So when we look at uh, what Jesus uh, uh, did for the woman in that, in that uh, episode, when he told those who gathered around him um, before they wanted to stone her, he said, if there is any one of you who has not sinned, let him be the first to throw a stone at him. Now, what is Jesus actually telling them? He's asking them to examine their conscience, to examine whether what they have said is true, even if she is a sinner, but have they done the right thing? Because he's challenging, challenging them about their hypocrisy of self-righteousness. They can't see the plank in their own eye, but, but they want to see the splinter in someone else's eye. Now, describing it in such a way. Eh? So Jesus draws each one of us also to examine our conscience daily. You know? It's an important part of drawing ourselves closer to Jesus, to our Lord. 
We cannot do without the examination of conscience every day of our lives. There must be a time that we afford and give time to God and sit and look at our own uh, realities. Even now, what are those areas of our lives that we have? We know or maybe consciously, unconsciously or subconsciously this is happening to us. Um, perhaps our uh, challenges in terms of, you know, frustration, uh, the difficulties, you know, the anxiety, the tension, and all that happens in the everyday life, you know, knowing that we are under even more, I think the youth were not extreme movement control order. If I'm not mistaken, they added something for some places where you cannot move out. You cannot go out of your own area, that area, but let say that means in inverted bracket, house arrest, so to speak. So tension will arise. So we have to look and ask ourselves, Am I allowing the mercy of God to help me walk this day knowing that He will take care of all that I'm going through, or what that I'm going through? Now we look at the, uh, the Gospel again, back to the passage of the adulterous woman. Yes, I've used the term, huh? that she was forgiven, yes. What would, you, what, would have, what would have happened to her thereafter? She was touched by Jesus. She was touched that Jesus restored her dignity, given her back her dignity. No more actually an adulterous woman, but a person who is valued by God and Jesus wants her to find salvation, that she also will find eternal life, that she too will experience eternal life for, the, for moving forward to do the will of God. So, with all our difficulties, when we have this examination of conscience every day of our lives, we are actually striving to walk the path that leads to life. We are also acknowledging that um, God wants us to live. Acknowledging that Jesus wants salvation for all of us. He doesn't want to lose any one of us. He wants every one of us to walk that path that leads to life. So, but yes, we are all not perfect. We will continue to, you know, to have our failures, you know, our, our falling, our falling. But he will pick us up. But we must also cooperate with Jesus. He will raise us up. But we must be able to say, Lord, forgive me, for I am a sinner. Help me to walk the path that leads to life, that leads to you, that leads to eternal, uh, to the kingdom of God. Many a time we will find ourselves so distract, distracted by what surrounds us. And there are times also we will be challenged by what people have to say about us. The gossip, you know, the, the rude, uh, the remarks and whatever. But we must not uh, buckle, you know, I mean, uh, to give in, to give in and say, uh, you know, like eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, you know, and start reacting the same way. Jesus teaches us through the question he asked her, if any one of you has not seen, cast the first stone. It's reminding each one of us. If you're going through our difficulty, we know that we would have, you know, um, not literally take a stone and thrown at someone else, but we would have cast stones on others by our words, through our words, through even our thoughts, you know, when we see someone passing by and we don't like, and we say, hmm, yeah, that, that fellow did this, you know, that drunkard, or, you know, those kind of comments that we will make when we see someone that we don't like. You know, sometimes we have this, huh? some people we meet for the first time, this kind of instant dislike, we do not know for what reasons it happens, you know, and then we try, and then we try to avoid that person. And whenever we see that person's like, oh God, why do you put the person in front of me? I'm just giving an example. But the point is, we know our weaknesses, but let not our weaknesses overwhelm us. Let our weaknesses be a means to draw ourselves closer to Jesus. And he gives us a beautiful way to draw us to him. This examination of conscience. He's calling us to a life of righteousness. And not self-righteousness. A life of righteousness. So we must know, end of the day, the gospel is telling salvation is found in God alone. And when, when we walk this path that we are this, in today's time and age, whatever the, the things that are happening. Be assured that God 
is with us. Be assured that God is leading us all the way. So I ask of you to, to maybe for today, based on the gospel reflection, is um, find time to examine your conscience daily. Not just once a week when you come to church or during Mass, I confess. But the preparation should always be there. But find time daily, the whole day. Either first thing in the morning or when you, or most of us will do it at the night, you know, when, uh, when everything is over, before we go to bed, we take some time to examine our conscience, to look at what has happened throughout the day. What are the, react, what are the situations that we have entered in or engaged in that may have caused hurt to someone or someone may have hurt us or things that we have seen and we have not we've avoided helping or doing something which is right because of fear. Uh, because it's going to take too much of my time. There's so many things that we, it's what you call sin of omission, you know. The act of committing something as well, the sin of omission, even the thoughts that goes through our mind, you know. So many aspects of our, aspects, you know, that we need to consider. And then when we, go, when we feel we go to bed, we ask the Lord for forgiveness for all the wrongs or the things that we have neglected to do, so that we, we sleep in the love of Christ, you know. Because we know we want to be reconciled with God, and to start a day, another day anew, knowing that we want to walk with God. So today, just one aspect of today's gospel, I uh, would ask of you is to take time. Uh, so remember that uh, God also teaches us something beautiful. Uh, um, all of us sin in various ways. There are some who sin, you know, in a grave way, we call mortal sin. This woman is caught committing adultery. It's mortal sin, indeed, you know. But how Jesus reveals his forgiveness, he says, you know, he's reminding us at the same time, you not know, to hate the sin, but to love the sinner. So when he told the woman to sin no more, he's, as I mentioned, he gave her back, she restored, he restored her dignity, you know. She, you know, uh, that means recognizing she is loved by Jesus. But the Lord tells her, sin no more. And that's what we must be conscious of daily in our life. Those areas that we persistently keep on doing, you know, may not even be a mortal sin, but it become grave over some time when it, when it eats us up, you know, and you start reacting to situations that surround us. So find the time. And, and, and you'll begin to see changes in your life because you want to do what is pleasing unto the Lord. You want to, um, you want to delight in Him. You want to do all that is right. But always be mindful that we are all mere creatures. You know, we all say fallen nature, but redeemed you know, by, by God through our baptism. And then, you know, with that, we're able now to live a life that is pleasing unto the Lord. That's why He's given us this new spirit. So let this new spirit move us, this new spirit in Christ Jesus to motivate us, to raise us up, you know, to, to strive to do what is pleasing unto Him. Brothers and sisters in Christ, um, yeah, this is what I wanted to share with you, and um, yeah, take it from here. So, if there be any questions that um, you would like to ask, it's time is now. Huh? Let me look at some of the. Sorry, yeah, just give me a moment. The question now, uh, there's one question, um, yeah. The recent blessings that the Pope gave, you know, uh, Urbi at Orbi blessing, what significance it has for us? Good question. Yeah? Now, what is this? Uh, um, it says, 
uh, it's a blessing in the most the most solemn form of blessing in the Catholic Church and is reserved for most solemn occasions. It could be during Easter, Christmas. Eh? So, um, no. I need to just give me a time of, because I was not online, on live eh, when the Bishop, when the Holy Father gave his blessings. There are certain conditions I think we had to fulfill in order to receive that blessing. Um, but then again, this special blessing to receive a plenary indulgence, to receive a plenary indulgence, uh, we must ask ourselves, did we fulfill uh, the conditions for a plenary indulgence. You know what plenary indulgence means, eh? that only your sins are forgiven, even temporal punishment is no longer there. So the word urbi at orbi means to the city, to the city and that is of Rome and to the world. It's a special apostolic blessing given by the Pope from the balcony of St. Peter's Basilica every year on Easter Sunday, Christmas and other special occasions. So. Um, because of this COVID-19 pandemic uh, and uh, all that is happening in the, the fact that churches are, are closed, we're not able to celebrate as a community the celebration of the Eucharist. So, um, so all those who spiritually join to this moment of uh, prayer where the Pope gives his blessings will be granted the plenary indulgence. The plenary indulgence granted for people who pray for an end to the pandemic, healing for the sick, and eternal repose of the dead. So, have we fulfilled some of the conditions? What is it that we cannot go for the Eucharist? Yes. So, what do? What else can we do? We can't go for sacramental confession, also for that moment. Moment. But it says follow the life streaming celebration of the Eucharist. Then some of the other devotions, you know. Uh, sitting before the Blessed Sacrament. A rosary, we are unable to do it because churches are closed. So what do you do? Pray the rosary, the chaplet of the Divine Mercy, to also call upon God eh, to end this epidemic, relief for those who are suffering, and eternal salvation for those whom the Lord has called to Himself. You know? So what does it do for us? Yes, it, you know, we don't see the, the what do you call, uh, the immediate uh, reward, eh? but is it that is eternal? Is life? So it is about. You know, if you think that this this plenary, uh, this uh, urbi and orbi, the blessing that God, uh, the Pope has given, is that is going to transform us. Well, it can if we believe in the you know the blessing that comes from our Holy Father is coming from God above, and this blessing is also not just uh, for ourselves, but it also imparting it to all others that who are working in the, uh, the in the in the uh, what do you call in this present moment uh, if i make if i make reference to the medical profession and all those involved in keeping the world safe you know so for us catholics uh, i hope you took the opportunity uh, and did what is needful not just you know like uh, gate crash and say i didn't do anything but i want this plenary indulgence you must also fulfill it huh? okay it's clear now any uh no I am not able, okay um, I'm trying to get go through your questions huh? um, for those who are unable to watch live that early morning but watch it later in the recorded version can the faithful still receive the plenary indulgence if one has fulfilled the conditions um, I would look at the heart. Huh? perhaps for whatever reasons, unable to be there in the early morning, or you missed the announcement, uh, did not know that this is going to take place. If truly your heart, you fulfilled it, yes. Because, I mean, you're, you're watching it, you know, it, though it's um, uh, recorded. But then again, it is not that you were lazy or you're disrespectful, but truly you want to participate one. You know, the greatness of God cannot be measured by just a particular moment in time. 
for god you know there's no such thing as time is timeless uh, so take take for it yes you fulfill the conditions or a plenary indulgence yes i would say so huh? um There are those who don't sit, they say they don't sit comfortably with indulgence, plenary or partial. Um, put it this way, yeah? because we're looking uh, from a human point of view, that we, some would say in the whole understanding, we're buying, you know, buying our way to heaven. Well, you know, when we look at it because of the history of our church, excuse me, then we look at it as uncomfortable, but you know, the mercy of God comes at various, you don't, it doesn't come all the time, you know, like this. And we must look at the Vicar of Christ, the you know, our Holy Father, you know, the Vicar of, the, you know, yes, you know, and, and uh, he has been empowered. We must recognize that he has been, he is the succession of the apostles, you know, handing down, you know, the authority of, of Christ to Peter and down to the ages and, you know, we don't see it, but he's been empowered by God to be able to do what he can do for us. And he's exercising his authority with that. And we believe, you know, and when we believe, because we're looking, we look at logic, we're looking at our own human uh, rationality and everything else, then we will not be able to uh, sit comfortably with indulgence or, or what we call a plenary or partial. Well, I mean, if you're not comfortable, uh, that doesn't mean that, you know, you're not uh, going you're, you're going against the will, no. But continue to do all the other aspects of what you believe in as faithful as possible and strive for holiness every day of our lives. But there are those who desire, you know, they find, you know, they're struggling and they really want to come out, to come clean, to want to be one with God, you know, in this manner because of their own struggles. And they take this opportunity and not just buying it, uh, but sincerely fulfilling all that is needed. So yes, there are people who are uncomfortable with it. We respect that. Uh, but try to look at it from the perspective of God sends his prophets, his priests, you know, even Pope to us. And that is our, our divine reality. We're looking at the human side of it. But what about the divine reality, which we cannot see, you know, but we can experience when we uh, put our faith in it. Huh? Okay. Yes, true. What you're saying, money, you know, buying, but there's no more. There's no more the case today. Yeah? I was there one of the Saturday morning, and I can say it was a wonderful experience. It was really inspiring. Very good for those who were there in the uh, to receive the papal blessing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, there is no questions. Um, I would like to continue with, you know, this, uh, you know, the sacrament of reconciliation, the part of the examination of conscience, you know. Some people say, well, you know, how do I do this? You know, what kind of materials do I have? Actually, when you come for the penitential service, you know, you always see projection on this, on the, on the screen, or even the parishes will give you a leaflet, you know, to go through the, uh, the areas that you need to reflect upon. And I think we, you know, um, we shouldn't be like saying, what do I do? What is this conscience all enough? It's about realizing whether I am one with God in my daily life, you know. Uh, where are the areas, you know, that I have turned away from Him or the areas that I don't recognize that I have turned away from Him. And this examination of conscience that we do, that we're called to do daily, helps us, you know, helps us to meditate on the word of god help us to meditate also on our daily living that we become a person who's mindful of the presence of the divine presence of god in our lives because that's where we are heading towards end of the day the spirit is alive so let the spirit motivate and move us you know uh, so let me just take some of the things that comes from the ritual itself huh? uh, now in an examination of conscience, before the sacrament of penance, that's normally before the sacrament of penance, but why not we take it even every day of our lives? You don't have to take it as a length. I mean, if you want to do it for one hour up to you, you can just take 
15 minutes, you know, every day before you go to bed, just just keep some time, look at the highlights of your of what you went through daily, you know. Uh, you know, the act of omission especially, perhaps things that we have not done that would be displeasing to God, that we would, you know, if we have done it, you know, you know, we know we are doing the will of God. If not, we're avoiding because of whatever it is. Look at those areas, the sins that, you know, that we have also committed knowingly, even unknowingly, and the thoughts that go through our minds daily, you know, that can affect our attitude to God. So, now one thing is important. Do I believe that I am a sinner? I presume all of us do. Huh? Um, when, we are, when we recognize that we all are sinners, then, then we know the words of Christ, no? I came for the sinner and not for the virtuous. Then we know that we must turn to Jesus daily in our lives. <clears throat> and if we recognize that, then you know the church has the sacrament of reconciliation or the sacrament of penance. Now, in this particular period of time, when uh, it is challenging for you to come to the church to, for confessions because of the restrictive uh, uh, the movement, movement control order, isn't it MCOES? The restrictive movement or the lockdown, if you put in simple terms, lockdown. Huh? We have difficulty, but you know, why not begin that reflection at home daily so that when the time comes for you to make a confession, you're ready, you know, you're really prepared. You know, in my experience, you know, as uh, sitting in the confessionals, especially for the penitential uh, uh, service, when it comes during Lent and Advent, yeah, those actually are actually not really prepared, you know, they just come in and they are not sure what to say. I'm not judging, you know, their, their lack of preparation, but maybe they do not know how to go about it. It is so important that you prepare from home, you know, and from home, um, so that when you come for the confession, you are truly a penitent, you know. You are truly sorry for your for your sins because you have reflected upon it and how grave uh, it can be or how venial it is, you know. So when we do that, so then we keep on. So some of the questions that maybe we need to uh, look up, look at is, you know. What is my attitude to the sacrament of penance? I mean, this beginning uh, before going into the examination of conscience. Uh, do I sincerely want to be set free from sin? To turn again to God? To begin a new life? And to enter into a deeper friendship with God? We must ask ourselves those questions. If I want that, then I will do the needful, you know. Or do I look on it as a burden to be undertaken as seldom as possible, you know, going for the sacrament of penance. As I said, if we worship God, remember I mentioned, you know, like we are all adulterous, you know, we have committed adultery rather, in this sense, because, you know, we, we sin, but that doesn't mean that, you know, we cannot come back to God. So. Um, and when, when we prepare ourselves, some of the things that we need to know when we enter the confessional is, do I forget to mention or conceal or deliberately conceal any grave sins in past confessions? Sometimes we are afraid, we are so shy or when we are afraid, we don't know how to confess some of the sins. Eh? We just like, uh, either we don't say it or we under our breath, you know, like in between all the venial sins, we say something hoping that the priest doesn't hear it and pass by, you know. But then it's not, you're not, you're not sincere, you know. You must be able to open up because God wants to hear you completely, you know. And this confessional, this sacrament is so beautiful. It's a time where you reconcile with God and with man. And uh, the reconciliation also drawing you to a time of restoring you to new life. Okay. Now, even at the confessionals, just before I go into the examination, but it's also part of examining ourselves, uh, whether we, we have, um, we, we are convinced of the sacrament of penance. Now, when the priest gives you the penance, the question that you must ask is, do I perform the penance I was given? And it that means, do I take it seriously? And not just say, okay, la. sometimes the priest, you know, gives you a lengthy penance, and say, I'll never go to the priest again. La. You know, sometimes they'll say, yeah, 
go to Monsignor Lexon, uh, he'll give you the whole rosary. I go to another priest, just give me one hour father. Why he does all those things? Uh? I'm here to justify myself, but the truth is, that means my attitude towards doing the penance is not there. I just want to be forgiven, and I don't want a lengthy penance. Just give me one hour for the hand up. Be sorrowful. That means I have come into the confession, and I want to be sorry for my sins. And when I'm sorry for my sins, I will long to do the penance. Even if it takes one hour, or whatever it is, I will do it for the glory of God. And not to complain and saying, hey, such a long penance, I better go to someone else the next time. Um, well, this is some of the experiences that we have. Huh? Um, did, I make, did I make reparation for any injury to others? That means after the confessions, you know, like I know, sometimes we'll say in the penance, huh, in the confessions, you know, I've hurt others. You know, I've done something wrong. So do I make reparations? But the reparation can be various ways, you know, praying for the person and striving to do good, you know, and trying to reconcile, to get back, you know. Reparations could be the prayers that we have as well. So have I tried to put into practice my resolution to lead a better life in keeping with the gospel? Yeah, because that's what penance is all about, isn't it? The sacrament. When I enter into the confessional, I want to be at right with God. I want to lead a better life. I want to follow the precepts of God. I want to look at the Ten Commandments every day of my life and to know that I am pleasing, I am, uh, I am pleasing unto the Lord. I want to know that you know I can lead a life of righteousness, not self-righteousness, but righteousness. I know that you know I have got uh, hidden agendas in my life. You know I'm a hypocrite from time to time, but I know I can come out of it in God's time because I'm walking the path that helps me to lead to a better life through the sacrament of penance. You know. So, examination of conscience. Uh, give me some, maybe some uh, expressions, which I think you've already gone through during the penitential services uh, and, uh, and the reflection that's, uh, that's put on the, on the screen or the leaflets given to you. Um, am I uh, loyal to my God? In my heart, is my heart set on God? so that I really love him above all things. And, I'm, and I am faithful, and I, am I faithful to his commandments? As a son loves his father. Or am I more concerned about the things of this world? Have I a right intention in what I do? Simple, huh? That means every day, every day. Do I love Jesus, Lord? Lord, do I love you? You know, end of the when I come, you know, as you go to the examination of conscience, am I a follower of Jesus? Do I follow him daily? Do I love his call? Do I respond to his word? Or am I so caught up with the things of the world that I have really no time or little time for reflecting on what God wants of me? We don't know. We have to, we have to ask yourself these things, you know. So do I have the right intention? In following what God wants of me, or do I do I take it very lightly? Yeah? And um, if we love God, there's something important that we must do daily, isn't it? We must communicate with Him, and how do we communicate through prayer? So, have I prayed? Do I pray daily? Yeah? Do I pray my morning prayer, my evening prayer, or the prayers that you said, like the Rosary, the devotions? Do I participate in it? Or do I just, you know, give maybe a short moment and say, okay, I just say one hour, part, that's it. I can go, I will go to work because I really don't have any other time. But that's short changing, isn't it? Don't look for cheap grace. Eh? The grace of God, what did Jesus do? Now, I just want to go back again. I, I have to connect it back to the gospel. This is what I wanted to mention. When Jesus says, neither do I condemn you, sin no more. What do you think? happened to Jesus after that. This was, you know, eventually days into his passion and death, isn't it? Now he's, he's actually reflecting that he's taken the sin of this woman upon himself so as to nail it to the cross so that she has given, that she has been forgiven of her sins and to experience new life. So in every moment where Jesus had done this, uh, he was taken to task and, for, and he, what he did for the woman, end of the day, 
He was taken to task and being persecuted and being crucified on the cross for your sins and mine. So he took it upon himself, you know. How profound, isn't it? You know, how beautiful for Jesus to forgive someone and take it upon himself now to say, I live for you, I'll die for you, but you will have life in me. So when we see the mercy of God in this manner, definitely we want to pray daily. Yeah? When I pray, do I really raise my mind and heart to God? Or is it a matter of just uttering words? Do I offer God my difficulties, my joys, my sorrows? Do I turn to God in time of temptation? There are so many areas that actually we can uh, focus on, right? So let us look at um, our relationship with God in this manner. There are so many other aspects. I mean, I can, I can, this can take uh, two hours, you know, or maybe a bit longer for you know, just to go through. If I dwell into each uh, question, but you know what I'm giving is giving a starter here for you to now write perhaps the questions that you would want to contemplate or ponder about uh, in the evening or when you come back, when you come home, you know, to examine yourself, you know, with a large with our relationship to God. You know, this one aspect, a relationship with, uh, with, uh, with, with others, it's also important. When you say relationship with, you know, uh, in our uh, in society, what happens, you know, so that we look at all the things that we do. Now, at this moment, most of us are at home eh, and we're working from home. So we don't have that encounter with our mm. colleagues and the environment that we're so used to. In a way, it's a blessing, isn't it, this time, that we don't have to sin so much as we would have kind of sinned when we are there. You know what I mean? In terms of, you know, sometimes we have no choice. We have to keep our mouth shut. We cannot say the things we want to say because we're afraid we'll lose our job. Because we see the things that are there that are, things that are being done are not right. I mean, so now in the home, keep, Find some time to, to write your, your, your means the word questions, eh? reflections in question form about how you're going to examine your conscience so that you know that you want to fine tune your whole body, mind, heart, soul, and spirit with God daily in your life. I mean, uh, yeah. yeah there are there questions? Eh? Are there questions? Um, I mean, I can go on, but I would rather have questions from you all. Eh? Yeah, someone just shared about the gospel on 23rd March talked about how Jesus seemed to be more kind and gentle to the woman. That's Maria you're sharing, huh? More gentle and kind to the woman than the blind man when he was healed. Now you're well again, do not sin anymore or something worse may happen to you. Uh, this is to the blind man. Huh? Can you elaborate, given back one's senses of human dignity is equally Healing, isn't it? Can I say that? So he's talking about the man born, uh, the man was blind since birth, and he says, now you are well again, do not sin anymore, or something worse may happen to you. Uh, how do we, if, how do you respond to this? If some, if that was told to you, you know, why is, was Jesus being uh, harsh? No. He was reminding the man who was born blind, if I was a man, you know, I was blind uh, and now I'm able to see and knowing the circumstances of the situation that surrounded him, do you think that he will be comfortable with what he's going to hear about himself? All the gossiping, you know, maybe you'd say, I'd rather go back, you know, to my old ways. So the Lord is telling him, do not give up on this new life I've given you. It is greater than all that you've experienced, you know. Because people were comfortable with him being blind. So that was, you know, like, uh, yeah, so they would pity him and, you know, do whatever that is needed. But now he is able to see. And they were challenged by who did this to you, you know. So for them, it was unthinkable, un unbelievable, right? So one aspect of it is that 
Jesus has restored his dignity back to him, just like the woman. But he tells, you know, for the blind man, what was the sin that he committed? But for the woman caught in committing, that was a sin, you know. So he, for Jesus telling her, sin no more. Also assuring her, I've restored this dignity. I mean, given you back your dignity. So for the blind man, he's been given back his dignity. He can get, he can integrate with society no more and outcast, so to speak. But Jesus tells him, be careful. Don't get caught up by what you see and then be lost in it and you lose yourself, you know. So he says, be careful or something worse may happen to you. It's not that God is going to punish him, but he can, you know, he can put it upon himself. You know? That's how I understand it. Huh? Even after the compassion, when asked, Wendy asked, even after the compassion and done, the act of contrition, we tend to repeat the same sin again after one or two days. Is it that our compassion is not sincere enough? It all depends on the individual, how you look at your penance. Eh? Yes, we will tend to come back with the same sin, but does that mean that we are, uh, that we are not sincere? Well, you have to look at ourselves. Eh? I, I put it this way, someone, you know, there are those who come to me and say, Father, I send out kind of futile, no? useless to come, confess the same sin over and over again. Every time I come, I confess, you know, and I go back to the same sin. I said, I said, yes, so, this God is not God merciful. He says, you know, innumerable time, you know, that he come, you know, I will forgive you. Now, don't we, we want his forgiveness. Right? We want his forgiveness. So why uh, condemn ourselves? Yes, we know we are sinning, but that doesn't mean we're sinning intentionally. Eh? If we're going to sin intentionally, there's something wrong. That means you're saying that, I don't care, but I'll go for compassion, wash my guilt and come out of it. But it's not the point. The point is that you're struggling with that sin. I give an example, uh, uh, which seems to be common. Uh, uh, they said, Father, I want to give up. So the, for the person, smoking is a sin, all right? And I want to give up smoking. But Father, every time I come back and I say, I smoke, you know? And these are, you know, talking about young boys, you know, young men, you know? And they're saying, you know, I don't know how to give. I said, okay, tell me. Uh, when was your last confession? They say, I say about, say, it's about uh, say it's six months ago. I said, how many packs did you smoke six months ago? Or they'll say maybe two, two packs, uh, two packs of cigarettes. Huh? I said, now, since six months until now, how many uh, cigarettes uh, are you smoking? Two packs, is it? No, no, father. I think it's less than one pack. I said, ah, you see the improvement that has taken place? But because you're not able to let go of it completely, you are struggling with it. And you are making efforts to get it right eventually. So is that our compassion not sincere enough? Only you will know, you know. Because when you are sincere deep within your heart, God knows huh, your capability. And he will work with you because you want to come out of it. Some can come out of it instantly because the desire is so intense. You know, some of us are caught up with everything that surrounds us in this world today, that we sometimes uh, procrastinate, you know, not intentionally, but we'll say, okay, tomorrow, and then tomorrow, and the day goes, and then it doesn't happen. But our hearts are there wanting to do what is right. So don't ever let the devil work in your mind and say, the confession is not sincere enough, unless you are not sincere. But if you're really sincere, then forget about that thought, but strive to say, I will make it right, you know, because God has given me the grace to sin no more. That's what he, Jesus told the woman caught. All right? Someone is asking, um, with this situation that we're in and the Lenten season, what do we do, uh, what can we do to observe Lent at home? I think very simple, uh, I would put it, you know, <coughs> practice the three Lenten observances uh, of prayer, fasting and abstinence. Uh, prayer, fasting and almsgiving, sorry. Now, um, 
because they think normally you know it's a it's our practice habit to visit the churches you know and to follow the stations of the cross at church now these are traditions which are very good it must continue once a day we come back to uh, when everything is over we must come back to it but when we are not given the opportunity to enter into the church and to do these uh, devotions especially the stations of the cross do it at home I mean, be creative, you know, uh, to observe land, you know, if you have more than one member in the family of course, I mean, during this time, if there's more than one in the family, sort out the stations of the cross. Be creative. Light for, have 14 candles for you. And for each candle, you light one candle, you know. And so if 14 candles, or you have the pictures of the stations of the cross, you flip it, you know, like flip chart. You flip one after another, following the stations of the cross. And practice all that we do in church, to stand or to kneel, uh, and to go through that process. You can do it at home, you know. I mean, I'm telling also, like, uh, they say, Father, well, what about Sundays, you know? I say, take up the, all the readings. If you have the family there, uh, a family members who are there, or uh, uh, friends are living together in the same house, do the readings. Don't worry about whether priests are doing the gospel at their home. You're not doing, you're not celebrating the Eucharist, but you're doing a form of a service. Take all the readings. And even, I will tell you, for Palm Sunday, read the Passion. Good Friday, read the Passion. Uh, divide the family, man. put your families, you know, tell them, okay, you take the role of Jesus, you take the role of the others, or, you know, the narrator. You're, you know, give, God is giving you an opportunity to do that at home, because you're not able to come to come to celebrate uh, the services of the others in church. So, there's so many ways you can be creative. Huh? And, um, yeah, you know, so, if you want to say, I, I would like to spend time before the Lord, i like you, to, if you have an altar at the home, we have the crucifix there, light a candle and, and just meditate in front of the crucifix. Take the word of God for the day and, and sit before the Lord. The Lord is present everywhere, isn't he? His spirit is very clear in all of us. So, yes, we look to the church because that's our, you know, like our pointer in this world, in this busy world. God gives us places of worship, the church, you know, for us to now to engage. So we are reminded of his beautiful, bountiful presence, you know. But when when we have this lockdown, then we look to our home and say the sacred space, create it so that we are able to observe land in the way that is best possible, the best possible way we can. Yes, so true, Tian. In my thoughts and in my words and in what I have done and what I failed to do, yes, you know, yeah, I meant I did not mention the word thought words. Huh? I said thoughts and commission and omission. Yeah, words. Yes, uh, the way we, yeah, what we, what we say, you know, how we hurt others with our with our words, you know, and uh, yeah, it's true. These are four clear areas for us to examine our conscience. True. Thank you. Uh, Right. Um, there's a question. Well, let me try to look, read the question. Uh, uh, a question in Urbi at Orbi session a couple of days ago. The crucifix of Saint Marcello was displayed in Basilica Saint Peter in the critical situation such nowadays because it brought miracle in Black Death in Europe according to history. Now, other make, other Christians say it's a practice of occultism. What is occultism and the difference? Okay, um, I cannot dwell too much into it, um, but I can just say that what is an, what is occult uh, is man-made uh, and something which does not, uh, that takes us away from God. Uh, any form of occult uh, for me is, it doesn't, it doesn't come from God. I use the word to, uh, to extend it's preternatural. Uh, it's not supernatural. What is supernatural is our faith. What is preternatural does not come from God. So occultism is preternatural. It's, it's how man creates something of a, of a movement that takes us away from God and the truth. And then even to the point of, you know, taking us into a realm that is not sacred anymore. You know, like uh, entering into, this, into what is uh, evil, what is not right. So occultism is not supernatural. Eh? The world will say things like supernatural, but for us understanding, 
Supernatural is all that comes from God. Preternatural is all that is not of God. So occultism is such. In a short span, in, 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 in what do you call, uh, yeah, in short, what it means. Huh? Being a Catholic is not easy. People expect us to be perfect in all our actions, your view. Obviously, being a child of God also is not easy. I mean, we say being a Catholic, anyone who believes in God and truly follows the way of God, uh, it's not easy because people will look at you and say, oh, so you, you know, like remember, you know, even now also, oh, you Christians, you know, you are not supposed to do this. You Christians, you have, you have heard that, isn't it? And when they see you, uh, like for those who know or Lent, uh, simple things like, hey, you're eating meat. You're not supposed to meet, eat, on, eat meat on Friday. You know, we go there and say, oh, yeah, they are very observant what we are doing. Yes, it's not, you know, people expect us to be perfect in all our actions. But what is perfection? No one is perfect in this world today. We strive for perfection because, you know, we know we have our weaknesses. So we do not hide, you know, we do not pretend that we are perfect. We want to be perfect. So people expect to be perfect. I would say that's their problem. What we need to do is not to comply, or, you know, to, 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 to give in to what people have to say about us. But it's most important is, I desire to be with God. I strive for holiness. I will strive for perfection, but I know I'm weak and I'm not going to be affected by the comments of people who say other things otherwise, you know. And it can sometimes, you know, when, it's, when you hear things that are upsetting, you know, you say, I'm trying my best and then this is what they say about me. Take it with a pinch of salt, meaning to say that if something is right of what they say, then I will make, I will work on it to improve myself. If it's not, leave it be. Because, you know, uh, if we all are going to be focused on words that are, what people have to say about us, then we will not know how to live a life that is pleasing unto, the, unto God. The word of God is more important than the word of man. Man can be, yes, they can also praise us, but they also can criticize us. The praises that are right and due, we accept it. The what is, uh, I mean, some people say constructive criticism, there be a, such as that. Then we take it, you know, and improve ourselves. For me, I'm not disturbed by people expecting priests to be perfect. I tell them, you're not perfect. Huh? It's just like you, all of us are just ordinary human beings, but striving to do extraordinary things in life, you know. And uh, if they have demands and expectations of us, then we pray, ask them to pray for us. Don't criticize us or judge us, you know, but help us to strive for it, you know, because when you, when you see someone who's doing, who's holy, who's doing right, and you want, you, you know, inspired by that, and when you see the person is failing, in that area after some time, encourage that person to come back. Not saying, oh, I expected you to do this, or I did, you know, I never knew you were like this. Uh, that is just, that's discouraging. But rather, yes, I know you're going through a difficult time. Be, at that time, uh, um, like how I said, when one is uh, strong at that moment, compliment the one who's weak by, by encouraging the person, you know, you can do, you can get back on track. Huh? Just in a short time, I know the time is uh, running here. Yeah? Uh, okay, I think that's about it. Huh? I have uh, given, well, rather it's not given, no, because it started a bit late today because of some technical glitch. Yeah? So thank you for your time and thank you for listening and uh, continue tomorrow same time. So let's close uh, with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. The Lord be with you. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you. We praise you. We glorify your name. For you are Lord and God of our lives. We know we are facing a crisis throughout the world. And we thank you for giving us that spirit of new life the spirit of courage, no longer living in fear or walking in fear, but taking every day as it comes with courage to know that you are with us. 
and to know that you always want to raise us up even from our even from our failures you reach out to each one of us asking us to reach out hold your hand so lord we want to hold your hand today and every day of our lives and never let go of your hand because it is you who leads us to true life to life to eternal life so bless all of us this day together with our family members keep everyone throughout the world safe in your love and care and we continue to pray that lord you will stop stop the spread of this virus that no one else will be affected and for all those affected will find healing and restoration to new life and bless all those who are helping to maintain order throughout the world can be difficult eh, for us sometimes to comprehend why this has to be done but we ask for blessings upon all those in authority give them the strength to recognize that we are all your children that we are all people with feelings and emotions that they know how to handle or to respond to each one of us with dignity as you gave the dignity or restored the dignity back to the woman that was caught in in adultery in today's gospel that you also restore the dignity to each one of us and let us share the dignity with one another all the days of our life we make this our prayer through Christ our lord amen and may almighty god bless us all in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen see you tomorrow have a wonderful day god bless us god bless you